Hello everybody, it's, uh, it's lovely to be with you online, even though we can't meet in person. Today is the 27th of December and that's, well, the last Sunday for 2020. I wonder, as you look back across 2020, what the things are that you want to praise God for. Because although it's been a difficult year, there's lots of things that we can praise Him for. And in fact, I wanted to start by reading a couple of verses to you from Psalm 145. This is written by David, a man who was used to difficult years and difficult times. And this is what he says. He says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. And that's true. The God that we worship, even in the midst of a very difficult year, is a great God. He is worthy of praise. He is worthy of exalting. And we want to do that as we meet together, even though it's online. And I want to invite you to, to stand and sing with us. We're going to be enjoying some more Christmas songs. Uh, the first one of them is, O Come All Ye Faithful. And this song invites us as Christians, as people who are faithful to God, who love Jesus, to stand and sing to him, to praise his name. Let's do that together. Having sung 
to Jesus, having praised God. Uh, the thing that we immediately sort of realise about ourselves is that we've fallen short, that we haven't done the things that God has asked us to do, that we've done things that he has asked us not to do. Now's the time for us to, uh, to think about that and to be honest. And I want to give you a moment to, uh, to reflect on that, to think through the things that have happened in the past few days, happened this week, that, well, have put you at odds with God. Let's do that now. The good news, of course, is that as we come before God and we're truthful about how we've fallen short, he wants to forgive us. And we're going to confess those things together. Uh, the words will come up on the screen. I want to invite you to say them along with me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. We have followed our own ways and the desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to mankind in Jesus Christ our Lord and grant, merciful Father, for his sake that we may live a godly and obedient life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Well, we know from the Bible that when we're honest with God, when we tell him the truth of our sins, that he forgives us and welcomes us into, a, into, our, into his kingdom. And we know this from, um, from Luke 23. It tells us, One of the criminals who hung there next to Jesus hurled insults at him, in verse 39. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And the same promise is available to us. And that is why we want to sing about Jesus' birth and his life, his death and his resurrection. And in fact, we're going to do that again now as we sing Silent Night together. I want to encourage you to uh, stand with us and sing with us.
St. John's, uh, let me tell you what's happening over the next month as we go into January. We are now just doing online services and will be until hopefully the last Sunday in January when we can come back again. So throughout uh, January, you will be able to access the online service via the website uh, for the last Sunday in December and then the four Sundays in January. To prevent us just from sitting by ourselves at home, we will be initiating what we've called Church at Home. So we want to encourage you to gather friends and family together as we are able to watch the service uh, together. So we will have sent out a form to you via email to say, yep, I can host or yep, I want to be a guest with somebody. So please uh, complete that. Uh, I really, we really want to try and maintain our community and there's no better way than doing that as we gather around God's word, as we um, can sing his praises and pray to him. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that during the month of uh, January. One of the things um, that we will be doing in January is a new series. So a new series will start that I will be uh, preaching myself and Chiz on the book of Proverbs. I called it Ancient Wisdom for a New Year. Great introduction to the new year as we again remind ourselves of how much wisdom there is in God's word, not just for salvation, but for the whole of life. So I'm looking forward to unpacking that with you for the four weeks of January. Not just that, in going forward into the new term, we will be starting a exploring a course into the Christian faith. Uh, we'll be starting with a course called Life Explored. And here's a quick preview of that. seems uh, very appropriate to be talking about God's uh, greatest gift in the Christmas time. And if you want to unpack the gift, then uh, I want to find out more about it, um, then uh, please join uh, me um, for this course. So send your uh, inqu inquiries to me. It runs over seven weeks. It will be one and it will be an evening during the week in uh, term one. Uh, the best day will uh, depend upon uh, what fits best for most people. So send me an email if you're interested and we'll, uh, we'll make that happen in term one. And that's it. Thank you uh, very much and I'll see you in the new year. Hi St. John's. 
As you know, our plans to say goodbye to Pete and Liz and the family have been rather scuppered over the last couple of weeks by the COVID outbreak. But rather than to let them slip away completely unnoticed, um, I wanted to be able to, uh, on your behalf, to say a formal farewell and thank you uh, to, to them. And particularly to Pete, who's been my right-hand man for the last two years. I've already mentioned in my uh, news note um, I sent out last week uh, that Pete's and Liz's ministry in many ways in kids and youth and administration and planning and music and, and preaching to mention but a few but I just wanted to add a couple more things uh, to what I said then in appreciation of, of Pete in particular. Pete came from being a senior minister uh, for several years at, at a previous church to move into the uh, second chair, if, if you like, here. And that is no easy thing to do. And I've really appreciated the fact that he's, he's done that with, with grace and has sat under my authority and um, even he hasn't necessarily agreed with everything I've decided or done. Um, nevertheless, he has said, look, James, if you say this is how it's going to be, if you want me to do this, then I will do that. And he's, he's done that. And I've always felt that he's had my back no matter what I've said and done. And, uh, and, I, can, and I can tell you that is no small thing when you're in any leadership position. So Pete, I really want to thank you for that. And secondly, um, I recognise that these two years, um, they've been pretty tough, uh, particularly this last year when we have had to cope with so much change, but Pete and the family even more so, coming into a new church with new people. Uh, you've got new home, new church, new schools, new relationships and then suddenly over this last nine ten months uh, everything's changed all over again and that has made life uh, very difficult and I've been constantly changing what I've been asking him to do as well within that time that has been very difficult um, so uh, Pete, again I want to thank you for that for being able to pick up things that that have happened and just throw things out in mind. I think particularly when we went straight into lockdown and, and in, in just a few days we had to pull together that first uh, service uh, from going from live to, to recording and Pete took that out and run we ran with that uh, for, for several uh, weeks uh, until we could work out what we were doing and um, without that then we would have you know, fallen flat on our face. So again, really appreciate that. What Pete did for that. So, we've got a couple of things here by way of a thank you, a couple of gifts. They may need some explanation <laughs> when, you, when you unwrap them, but uh, sure. uh, there's also a card on its way. Okay. Uh, but we're still gathering messages within that card, so uh, but please. We'll unwrap them and see unwrap, what's in them. See what's in them. Uh, yeah. the, uh, the top one says, Fragile, handle with care, so I, I won't throw it on the ground first. Um, <laughs> okay, I saw. <laughs> wow. Oh, golly. Wow, we. Okay, so thank you very much. There are some. Lots of Bunnings vouchers. And there is a picture of a chicken coop uh, on a piece of paper here and I, and hopefully many eggs still in one piece inside. So that's for, uh, we're planning to, well, our kids really want chickens at Currajong. So now I guess I'm stuck. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way, there's no going back. There's no going back. And let's, let's look in the other one and see what there is there. We're devising uh, humorous names for the chickens, like Parmigiana. 
nugget. <laughs> oh, that's just that. cruel. It is cruel. <laughs> yes, I've been told by one of my children I'm not allowed to do that, but we'll see. Oh, okay. Uh, and the other box has in it uh, some more Barnings vouchers. Fantastic. Uh, and some barbecue tools. Uh, and this is for a new barbecue as well. And wow, this is fantastic. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your kindness and generosity. Um, it, as James has said, it's been a very, very interesting uh, two years for us as a family. Uh, I do want to say though that there's so many people here that we've, we've got to know and, uh, and really loved getting to know and we'll miss uh, so many of you and uh, you know where we are. So if you're driving up Courage on the way and you think you'd like to have a cup of tea, then please, uh, please drop in and of course, um, we'll be praying for God's work here and the growth of his kingdom and, uh, and for your individual parts in those things and, and what God's going to do here in the future and excited to see what that is. So thanks very much for having us and uh, thank you again for these lovely gifts. Why don't I pray for Pete now and, <clears throat> and the family as they move on to their new home and, and church. Lord God, we thank you for Pete and Liz, um, Eleanor, Alistair and, and Cindy. We thank you for their ministry uh, at St. John's in Beecroft and their friendship uh, with us as well over these last two years. And we pray for them as they move on uh, to Carajong. We pray for them as they settle into their new home and church and schools and all the relationships that they will be rebuilding. Lord, we ask that you would go ahead of them, that they will be well received with love and open arms in the church and in the wider community, and that they will be um, loved and make connections there, and they'll be able to serve there in a way that they can use all their gifts so that they can grow your kingdom. And we ask that you would bless them so that they will be fruitful in all they do, that it will glorify the Lord Jesus, and we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament Bible reading comes from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Come, breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone, we're cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is taken from the first letter of Peter, Chapter 1, 1 Peter 1, beginning at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, 
exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 2020 has been a year like no other. The adjective that I've heard used to describe 2020 more than any other is unprecedented. In fact, the use of the word unprecedented in 2020 has itself been unprecedented. In one way, it's rather ironic that what has determined so much the course of history in 2020 should be something named in the previous year, 2019. COVID-19, of course. The number of cases of infection and death caused by this virus are horrific enough, but they, of course, only tell part of the story. In addition to the grief caused to hundreds of thousands of families, there's been the added distress of job losses and the devastating repercussion, repercussions on mental health and well-being caused by lockdowns, which have impacted many more millions. And of course, some are still enduring now. It's no surprise then that Conversations I've had with several people recently have had the same theme, epitomised by one with a lady at our carols event. She said rather dejectedly, I just want to forget 2020. I'm hoping that 2021 will be so much better. People are turning their backs on 2020 and instead looking to 2021 in hope. When I asked her why she thought 2021 would be any better than this year, she said, because then we will have a vaccine and life can get back to normal. At this point in the conversation, I could have talked about how a virus mutates and the recently extreme contagious a variant of the virus that's sweeping across the UK and Europe and how the vaccine development is always one step behind playing catch up but I didn't because I could see in her eyes that she needed this hope it was like the light at the end of a very long dark tunnel but I'm sure you've heard the joke about dark tunnels that go something like this I thought I saw the light at the end of the tunnel, but 
It was just my boss with some more work and a torch. Hmm. Is it that all there is to hope? Just wishful thinking, which is ultimately deluded. Perhaps it's hope against hope. Like hoping to win the lottery when the chance of being struck by lightning is 36 times more likely. Hope against hope is a phrase that means hoping for something despite the evidence that strongly suggests or even proves that it can't possibly happen. Is this what the hope of uh, that lady at the carols amounts to? Is that what the hope of returning to normality in 2020 is? Hope against hope. And if it is, then would it be right to disillusion her? Or perhaps not. Viktor Frankl, in uh, uh, Psychological Reflections on Auschwitz, famous, uh, famously observed that hope against hope was what made survival in the death camp possible for many. He compares hope against hope to the uh, delusion of reprieve observed by some death row prisoners who right up to the very end are able to believe that they will be found innocent. In Auschwitz, Frankl insists that this happy self-deception saved the lives of thousands. It kept them alive in spite of everything. All this suggests strongly that Hope is an attitude necessary for life, especially for people living like so many today in the midst of suffering. But what is the nature of true hope? Where can it be found? And what does it mean for those that have it? That's what we're going to spend a few minutes exploring today. Firstly, the nature of hope. Interestingly, the phrase hope against hope actually comes from the Bible. The Apostle Paul uses it to describe the attitude of Abraham when he was told by God that he and his wife Sarah would have a child. This is what Paul says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. So Abraham was 100, Sarah his wife was 90 when their firstborn son Isaac was born. So established medical wisdom was that this was impossible, i.e. there was no hope. But Abraham hoped that this would happen. His was hope against hope. Why would he hope for such a thing? Well, the next verse tells us. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. So Abraham's hope is based on the promise of God. This story gets to the core of the biblical notion of hope. So in the Bible, hope is the eager expectation of God's promised future. The eager expectation of God's promised future. For the Christian, it is the yearning, the desiring, the pressing forward part of our lives, the part that makes everything here and now seem worthwhile, even if we are in lockdown, separated from families and friends, and unable to meet face to face. So what exactly do we hope for as Christians? What is the future that we are meant to be so eagerly expecting? Well, the content of the hope boils down to four fundamental things. The first is Christ's second coming. In fact, the language of the second coming is a little misleading from the perspective of the New Testament. The return of Jesus at the climax of history is his ultimate coming. 
So what happened between 5 BC and AD 30, the most likely dates of Jesus' earthly ministry, that was not the full feature, but a sort of preview of the glorious arrival of the Messiah at the end of time. The historic ministry of Jesus of Nazareth was, if you like, a sort of advance notice of who the coming Messiah is, what he really stands for, how he is able to open up his kingdom, even to the guilty like you and me. But it is only when Jesus arrives in universal glory that the Messiah mission foretold in the Bible will be fully realised. So secondly, the second thing that we hope for is final judgment, or perhaps more accurately, justice. The central role of the Messiah, according to the Bible, is to overthrow all that is opposed to God. First Christians, in particular, longed for Judgment Day, not because of some sort of spiteful desire for vengeance, but because they wanted the wrongs of the world to be righted, living as they were under sporadic and sometimes state-sponsored persecution. They wanted everything to be put right. And a final reckoning is coming, by which oppressors will be judged and the oppressed will be given justice. That is something that we hope for. Thirdly, resurrection life. The New Testament asks its believers to look expectantly beyond the grave. And this is more than just a, a soul-only existence somewhere in God's heavenly presence. Those who belong to Jesus will enjoy a transformed bodily existence. One model on Jesus' own resurrection. And this takes us to the fourth and climactic aspect of Christian hope, God's new creation. Both the Old and the New Testament envision the kingdom come not as a sort of soulish eternity in a heavenly realm, but the reality of heaven come down to earth. The biblical promise of the resurrection finds its counterpart in the pledge of a restored creation. So these four fundamentals constitute God's promised future. They make up the basic shape of Christian hope. But listening to them, you might quite rightly say, well, James, these all sound very nice, apart from the judgment bit. But frankly, none of those are more likely than an effective COVID-19 vaccine. How is what you're saying not just born from a sort of pie in the sky when you'll die feeling? And that's a good question. Which is why we need to look at the reason for hope. Biblical hope is the eager expectation of God's promised future and it is guaranteed by his prior activity in the world, particularly in his activity in Jesus. Jesus' earthly life was not just the preview of his identity and character as the Messiah, as I said earlier. It is also the foretaste, the guarantee of his kingdom. We see this in a number of ways. Firstly, in the miracles of Jesus. Jesus' miracles, his healings, his exorcisms, control over nature. They're deliberate signs of the restoration of all things in God's future kingdom. Jesus himself states this explicitly. He says, if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus' divine powers are glimpses of the kingdom of God. In God's future kingdom, evil will be overthrown. Frail bodies will be restored. Nature itself be renewed. Jesus preempted all these things in his ministry, casting out demons, healing the lame, the deaf and the blind, bringing order and blessing to the physical world. Think of the calming of the storm, the multiplying of the loaves and fishes. What will one day be fully realised in God's kingdom has been demonstrated in miniature in Jesus' deeds. So our, the future hope that we have is intimately connected, connected with the past, with Jesus' historical activity. And the fact that Jesus has shown us the kingdom assures us that it exists and that it's on its way. 
So, that's the first thing, the miracles of Jesus. Secondly, another future reality is brought into the present, and that's the raising of Jesus from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is not simply proof that he was the Messiah, or certainly that, but it was a demonstration of one of the Bible's most fundamental promises about the future, that at the end of history, God will raise the dead. This promise finds guarantee within history in the resurrection of the Messiah. Jesus raising to life is the first act of God's new creation. As the Apostle Paul puts it, Christ indeed has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, i.e. those that have died. So that's the second reason for the hope. And the third reason, also grounded in God's past activity, is the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift to every believer. This is a down payment of the coming reality. Now this probably requires a little bit more explanation, so here we go. In the Old Testament, God's future kingdom is described as a world fully possessed of God's Spirit. All life will be revived and empowered by the breath or spirit, a ruach is the Hebrew term, of God. So we heard in our Old Testament reading from the prophet Ezekiel, now this is God's words. He says, Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. And the New Testament says that this future age of the spirit is glimpsed in the gift of the spirit now. For instance, the Apostle Paul says that in advance of the spirit-possessed life of the kingdom to come, God has given his children a deposit of that future payment. So Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, he says, When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. What is this inheritance? It is the spirit-filled life of God's future kingdom. There will come a day when God will breathe on his people and they will come to a new life, a resurrection life in a new land, a restored creation. And until then we have that down payment of that breath, the gift of the Holy Spirit that prepares us now for the kingdom to come. How? By transforming our minds. By enabling us to love God and others and to serve God and others by growing us in the likeness of Christ. In short, fitting us out for God's kingdom. My point is that history and the future hope are intertwined. What God has done already guarantees what he said he will do in the future. So hope, then, is not just mere wishful thinking. It's certainty based on what God has promised and already foreshadowed. Okay, so what? What difference should or could that make to us as Christians or to the woman I spoke to at the Carrots? So my final point, how can we live in hope? The first thing I need to say here is that we need to be born again. We need new birth. Our New Testament reading was Peter writing to Christians across Asia Minor. And he says this, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. So notice a few things here. The living hope that Christians have. It's real. It's not false. Notice it comes from the resurrection of Jesus. Proof of what's to come, as I said already. And notice the inheritance language again. And it's guaranteed. It can never perish or spoil or fade. But especially notice how this happens through new birth. 
Without new birth, there is no hope. So to have hope, you need to put your trust in Jesus. Just as the Christians who Peter is writing to have. Though they have not seen Jesus, they love him and believe in him. Verse 8 in that first chapter. So, new birth. Secondly, this hope does not exclude suffering. It doesn't exclude suffering. Peter's original readers are suffering. Grief in all kinds of trials, Peter says. In fact, the Christian life is marked more by suffering than triumph. But hope gives us the ethic of patience in the face of adversity. The ethic of power, strength and confidence to finish the race. And an ethic of preparedness, a readiness at any time to be called home. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is hope gives us joy. Peter says his readers greatly rejoice in spite of their suffering. And they are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? Verse 9, because they know that their salvation will be fully realised when Jesus returns. I, it is 100% guaranteed. So perhaps we can sum all of that together by finishing that definition. Hope is the eager expectation of God's promised future, guaranteed by his prior activity in the world, and expressed in a life lived joyfully in the Spirit, despite all this world's momentary troubles. That is Christian hope. So I wonder, what could I have said to the woman at the carrots, who was rather depressed and pinning all her hope on immunologists? Well, perhaps I could have simply nodded, smiled and said, I'm hopeful for 2021 too, but for different reasons. And then we would have seen where the conversation had gone. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you for the promises you have made, some of which you've already kept, some still to be fulfilled. Thank you that because of the former, we can have a sure hope for the latter. Give us, we pray, an unquestionable confidence in the future because and only because of Jesus Christ. Amen. We've got lots to pray for today as 2020 finishes and 2021 begins. Let's bow our heads and pray together. And uh, I'd love you to, uh, to say amen, as I say in Jesus' name. Father God, we thank you for so many good things that you have given us this year. For Lord, good government, via Gladys Berejiklian's New South Wales government and Scott Morrison's federal government. Lord, we thank you for our bishops, Bishop Chris Edwards and Archbishop Glenn Davies and all the great work that they have done. Lord, we thank you for uh, healthcare professionals uh, in Australia. Lord, we thank you for um, education and employment specialists and Lord, IT specialists, all of whom have done amazing jobs looking after us through a very difficult time. We thank you for the way that you have blessed us this year with lots of rain and that we've seen our environment uh, have a real breath of fresh air and meet conditions where many people stayed at home. Lord, we thank you that in Australia, uh, the incidence of COVID has not been near as serious as other places. Lord, we thank you for our church, our church family, the way that people have sought to care for one another and look after each other and for the way that technology has allowed us to continue to do that. Lord, we look forward to next year. Um, we want to pray that you would give all of our leaders wisdom, 
as they seek to give us advice as to what to do next. Lord, we want to pray for many countries overseas where COVID appears to be out of control and people are dying. We pray that you would be caring for families and the Christians and churches there would be able to reach out with the good news of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we thank you for holidays that are coming up. We thank you that you give us uh, space and time to rest from work and from education. Lord, we pray that, uh, that you would keep uh, members of our church family safe during this holiday time. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to have time with you, that you give us real rest and relaxation. And during this time, Lord, that we wouldn't shrink back from sharing Jesus with people that we meet in various places that we are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we, uh, we, want to, we want to plan for 2021. Lord, we pray for our church. Uh, Lord, as it takes on new staff, uh, Ben McSweeney. Lord, we want to pray for um, the plans that we've got for outreach, for building programs, for all sorts of changes that will need to happen this year, that you would bless those things and uh, help them to go forward. Lord, we, we want to pray for uh, universities, and schools as they seek to plan for 2021. Not 100% sure of what that's going to look like. Lord, we want to pray for people in our church and in our community who are struggling to find jobs uh, at the moment or in the middle of trying to sort out what employment will look like for them in 2021. Lord, we pray for our medical system as, uh, as it tries to cope with the, uh, the daily changes and Lord, we want to pray for people in our community who are finding it difficult uh, due, due to physical or mental health issues. Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to finish off uh, by saying the, the collect together. The words will come up on the screen. We'd love you to, to pray that with us. Let us pray for our families. Father, help us to live as the holy family United in respect and love, bring us to the joy and peace of your eternal home. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Well, we are, we are going to sing one more song and it talks about the thing that we actually spoke about on Christmas Day, and that is joy. Joy to the world. And why? Well, because of Jesus. Today we've spoken about hope. People find hope in lots of different places, don't they? In family, in their work, in riches, in comfort. But we've been encouraged to find hope somewhere else, and that is in Jesus. And I, uh, I want to finish off today by reading to you from Romans 5, which talks specifically about hope. 
and our faith. Uh, I think sometimes as Christians in Australia, we're encouraged that our, our faith is a, a hopeless thing, a pointless thing. But Paul was a man who understood a difficult culture, a difficult life and a difficult place, and yet he could say these words. Starting at, uh, at verse 1 in Romans chapter 5, it says this, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on and he says this. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I don't know how you're feeling today. I don't know how you're feeling about 2020. Me, not an amazing year. I don't know how you're feeling about 2021. But I want to encourage you to have faith in Jesus. That is the place that we find our hope. That is the place that we look to, well, not just the great things that God has done in the past, but the amazing things that he will do as Jesus returns in the future. Don't get stuck in here and now, but look to God's eternal plan because his love has been poured into our hearts by the Spirit and it continues to work in us each day. I hope you've enjoyed uh, being with us this morning at St John's Online and uh, I want to wish you uh, a happy new year and encourage you to continue to trust in Jesus.